Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. All right, Jordan, what's going on, man? How are you? What's up, Dave? How are you doing? Nothing, man. I appreciate you doing this. My pleasure, man. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think uh, there's so many things that we could talk about. I think we could go on for hours, but I'm conscious of your time. And so uh, just a little bit of context around maybe why I wanted to have you on in particular is I'm lucky on the podcast that I've talked to like really high level coaches and some elite athletes and stuff. But I think some of the nutrition advice we give is for like the one on oh, 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 oh percent of the population. And yeah, yeah. uh I have a ton of respect for you because I feel like you're just a regular guy giving great advice to us mere mortals who are not trying to go to the Olympics. You know what I mean? So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, man. I appreciate that a lot. Seriously. Thank you. Yeah. I, I love your approach to it. And I love your, your, I mean, I work in the medical side and we obviously have an overlap in the strength conditioning fitness side, but I love like sometimes that it's just the noisiest industry. I think we work in like medical fitness, nutrition. It's so noisy. The internet's a blessing and a curse. And I feel like sometimes it's really overwhelming to like, I get notes from parents and coaches are like, I just want to lose some weight. I just want to work out. I just, I'm so unmotivated. So I was like, who is on, who is on my top of my brain of someone who I go to myself to get that information. And you're there, man, you're there, bro. I, I feel so bad for, for people who are just trying to get a little bit healthier mm. because there's so much conflicting information. I get people messaging me every day. Like, how do I know who to believe? And mm -hmm. I'm like, honestly, it's a very difficult road to figure out who you're supposed to believe. And so for me, I consider myself very lucky because I got in this industry when I was really young. I've, I, it wasn't difficult for me to get 10,000 hours in. Mm. And, and when I got involved in the industry, I was really, I was in an environment that was very science-based. They taught me how to read science-based research. They taught me how to critically analyze it. Mm. And I mean, it would be like if, if I, if I tried to uh, understand law and mm. court cases, yeah. like, is, like the reason I hire a lawyer is because I don't know that stuff and yeah. I want them to deal with everything. It's like, I don't have the time or the ability or really even the desire to learn it. So I yep. get why people are struggling. Yep. Um, I, for me, the, the biggest thing I always tell people is the, the best, the best way to tell someone is not a good fit is if they're very dogmatic, Yep. right? Like if they're, if they're single, like solely dogmatic one way, nothing else, like take a step away from them and, and look elsewhere. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you, were you in the, I'm in Boston now. Were you around like Cressy and those guys and Boyle? I, I interned at Cressy uh, Performance. I, gr it. I grew up in uh, Sudbury. Oh, so nice. I grew up in Sudbury, and a lot of my friends were Eric's first ever clients from Lincoln Sudbury High School. Yeah. And so when I was wrestling, a handful of my buddies were like, Eric trained them for free. Yep. Because this was before Eric was the baseball guy. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so I remember I was working out, and a lot of my buddies were like, you got to go to Eric's place. Like It was yeah. like the old, 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 old facility. So. Yep. I was really lucky to be around them from the time I was 14, 15. Mm, I feel the same way. So Mike Reinald is my boss and friend who is Cressy's He's like buddy. Awesome. And I'm He's working awesome. there now and I'm like, I'm just blessed to be around you two geniuses, right? So it's awesome to have them. Um, it and, really, it forces you to level up too. Oh like it really, when you're around people that intelligent, at least for me, I knew I would never be as intelligent as someone as like Eric Cressy. Like yeah. I knew like, there's no way, but I bet I'm smarter because I was around him than totally. I would have been if I wasn't around him. Totally. I feel the same way with Mike. Like sometimes in a client session, like our tables are closed. So like he'll be so casual. And then like somebody will come and like advance ACL. And I'm like, what are you talking about right now? Like I have <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, are we reading the same research right now? Cause I have no <laughs> clue what you're saying. So yeah, I feel the same way with Mike. Um, I digress though. Anyways. Um, yeah. So one thing I think I really, find the most value out of, out of your stuff. And I've gained a lot of it myself as I kind of transition from, you know, an athlete to just a general old fitnesser is like the concept of like how important um, consistency is. Like I really mm -hmm. think in the medical side, on the strength conditioning side, and, and from your opinion on the nutrition side, maybe of how like it's, I, I get this approach in the Western society. It's just like, you gotta be super disciplined and white knuckle it and work harder and kill yourself, right? And like reality is that like, consistent small habits and small changes are the best way in the medical side to get better. It's the best way to get stronger. So what are your thoughts on like kind of cutting through that myth of just like killing yourself and more like consistency and small habits? Man, I mean, it's one of those things where I, I tweeted the other day, I was having a conversation about this and my tweet was to the effect of doing one thing consistently is better than doing everything inconsistently. Yeah. And, and I think we all know this, like logically, we all know this. I, I don't think it's a matter of people believing that doing, uh, doing 
everything inconsistently or going super, super hard seven days a week. I don't think it's a matter of them believing that uh, being inconsistent is better. I think it's a matter of them believing that in order to make progress, period, Mm -hmm. they need to work out seven days a week and they need to only eat quote unquote clean foods and they must cut out all carbs and no sugar. It's like they've fallen trapped to the myth that perfection and it's not even perfection realistically, but they fall in midst of the trap that perfection and, and, uh, and essentially what boils down to complete and utter restriction is essential for success. And that's just not the case. Mm-hmm. And so I think whether it's the medical field, whether it's nutrition, whether it's strength training, whatever it is, whether, whether it's building a business, it mm-hmm. all boils down to consistency. That, mm-hmm. That's literally it. And doing a few things very, very well for the core over the course of five, seven, 10 years will yield infinitely better results than doing everything really, really, really well for a week Mm. or two weeks. And that's usually what most people do. Yeah. Yeah. And in your experience, I mean, you've worked with thousands of clients now from the everyday Joe to to super high level famous people. What's like the one thing, if you knew people missed the boat on like doing consistently, what would you think that would be, whether it's weight loss or something of that nature? You know, it's, uh, my mind immediately starts having like an internal battle Mm -hmm. because, uh, on one hand, I think I'm, I'm trying to figure out who to talk to, right? Sure. You know, so just, how about just the athlete, everyday person? But there, there are different things to discuss. I, I think for a trem- obviously a huge portion of the population is severely overweight. Mm-hmm. Like, obviously, like mass, like obesity crisis. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those people, I think the, the major thing they're missing the boat on is walking. Yeah. Right. Just, just. And literally five minutes a day, literally getting up and doing something. Um, when they hear me say that, they think I'm bullshitting them. They, <laughs> yeah. think, that I, they think it's, they, they're like, no, it can't be that simple. I'm like, I'm not saying it's that simple. And I'm not saying just walking for five minutes a day is going to get you a shredded six pack. But what they don't understand is the effect physically, mentally, emotionally that happens from doing that one thing consistently Mm. and what happens as a result of it. They don't understand that when I say walk five minutes a day, when they're going from literally nothing, well, if they actually start walking five minutes a day, well, they're probably going to start feeling better and not just probably, but definitely, especially from uh, serotonin release from endorphins. And then what happens when they start doing that, when their self-efficacy increases? Oh, well, then they start eating a little bit better. Sure. They start making those changes on their own. So for me, it's like, what's the one thing? And for me, I I used to say they should start with nutrition Mm. because from a fat loss perspective, weight loss perspective, nutrition is king. But in recent years, I've changed that because nutrition, I think, is harder to change than movement. I think it's easier for most people to say, you know what, I'm going to get 100 steps in right now than it is to say, I'm going to have this big salad. Yeah. Right? It's, it's way, it's a bigger obstacle to make a salad that maybe you don't like, maybe you're not a fan of salads. Yeah. So it like, sucks to eat it. <laughs> worst comes to worst. If you, if the goal is to get a hundred steps and you could walk to the fridge, right? Cool. Like, so for me, I want to stack up wins as quickly as possible. Yeah, that's great. I love that advice too. And also too, like, oh, we all know nutrition is a little bit deeper seated, right? It has some more deeper mm-hmm. emotional connections. It's a little bit raw. It pokes on some tough nerves in there. I mean, walking and moving is really not like a high barrier to entry. Like you said. No, it's not. It's really not. Um, and, and you're right. Nutrition, there's a lot of emotion that comes with it. There's a lot of culture that comes with it. There's a lot of upbringing, your past. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot, I mean, emotional eating, binge eating. There's like a lot. There's people can really use nutrition as, uh, as a crutch. Yeah. People can really use nutrition as something to lean on in a really difficult time. Yep. And there are people that use exercise as that crutch, but they're fewer and further between. And, odds are if someone's using exercise as a crutch, then they're not going to need my help for weight loss. Sure. So yeah, there's, there's just, that's just not my client. So I'm not talking <laughs> to that person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And something you, you just said there, which is so important is kind of like that motivation factor or like the ability to do something like, I can't think of a time more in my 30 years of being alive, but all that I hear from people all the time about like second half of a pandemic, man, the last thing I want to do right now is exercise. The last thing I want to do right now is eat well. I want to go pizza, Netflix, lay on my couch for four hours. Like I get it, man. It was hard to work out even now and stuff, but I feel like that's another area. I really love the message that you put out on is the, that it doesn't take this like lightning bolt of, uh, you know, magic to open from the skies to be motivated that like you have to do something and then it kind of trickles back a positive feedback loop. Then you do something else. And so I, I enjoy that concept you put out, but what, what are the things you're telling to your clients now about trying to stay somewhat forward progress of like going into year two of a pandemic right now? So, I mean, it's a great question. There's a lot to cover with that, but I'll give you the example of literally why I was almost late to this podcast right now. So I had, um, 
I had about an hour of free time and, and throughout the course of this pandemic, I've outfitted my own home gym. Right? It's literally right here, li- less than 10 feet away from me. I yep. could step in my own home gym. Um, I did not want to work out. I had an, a free hour where I was like, okay, I, I, I should work out. I internally, I wanted to work out, but I was not motivated to, and I did not want to at all. And I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm not going to work out, but I am going to go rollerblade because I really love rollerblading and, I, and it's a beautiful day out, like one of the first beautiful days in New York in a while. It's like, screw it, I'm gonna go rollerblade. And so I just did about 45 minutes of rollerblading. I had a lot of fun. Was it as quote unquote effective as a, a well-designed strength training workout? No, of course not. Right. But it was really, really fun. And I'm in a better mood because of it. And I got some movement in. And for me, that's what I talk about with clients. I'm like, listen, you're not going to have the best workout every day. You're definitely not going to want to work out every single time you're supposed to work out, but doing something is always better than nothing. Uh, and it's a cliche thing and it's really hippy dippy, but this is why I always say you have to find something that you're going to enjoy. Mm. Like you really have to do your best to find something you enjoy. And for whatever it's worth, that brings up a whole separate discussion, um, which I spoke about recently in terms of not everyone's going to like exercise. Yeah. Like, that was just, a great post. That was a phenomenal video. Thank you, man. Thank you. And not everyone's going to like it. And, and it's a difficult discussion to have with a client when they're like, well, I just don't like exercise at all. Like I hate it. It's, but I, I get that, but you have to do it. Mm-hmm. You just have, like, and, and that's why we're having this conversation. That's why you've hired me. That's like, because you're scared of the repercussions if you don't. Yeah. And and what's really going to happen is like, and what I spoke about in that post was this concept called willful suffering. It's like, you're either going to choose to suffer through this exercise that you don't like, but you will be happy that you did when it was over, Mm. or you won't choose to suffer now and you will unwillingly suffer later as a result of it, whether it's short term, like acute in terms of you just feel bad about yourself tonight when you go to bed or chronic long-term, just the legitimate negative effects of not exercising for a long period of time. Mm. It's like you get to choose whether you're going to willfully suffer or unwillfully suffer. And uh, it's not a fun answer, but (laughs) it's the truth. And from what I've found, a lot of the people who, who don't like exercise appreciate hearing that because a lot of coaches are just like, you just, you just got to find what you enjoy. It's like, but I don't fucking enjoy any of it. So now just do it. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's, uh, oh, the one thing I want to point make is first, like, that's crazy how much of a parallel that is on the medical side. Like imagine somebody who has a label repair or a, an ACL tear and they don't ever exercise before they did. They like fell down their stairs. Right. And now you have this person with back pain or knee pain and you're like, all right, we have eight hours of exercise to do this week. And you're like, I'm not doing any of this. It's 100%. brutal, man. It's brutal. But I agree with you that if you can one, I would say that if you can find the lowest barrier to entry, but also it's so important to map to their goals. Like you just said, right? Like someone doesn't want to do the bike, but maybe they don't want to not be able to walk with their kids when they're older. They don't want to not see their grandkids. They don't want to all sorts of other shit we could say. But like we say that a lot in the medical side is like, yeah, I know you don't want to do these squats right now, but you definitely want to be able to pick your daughter up in six months. Like, so like there's a big psychology aspect here of trying to read the person and be like, nobody cares about sprinting faster if they're coming for that kind of stuff and they're not an athlete. So it's like, what can we do for you? That's your meaningful goal. I love that. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, and on that kind of on the next note, the other thing I was, you just popped into my brain was a lot of times when people do that. So say for you example, in rollerblading, like a lot of people would go rollerblading and judge themselves because they didn't do the hard ass workout. They didn't go to your strength mm-hmm. training. And I think that's something that I struggled with a lot as I moved away from an athletic point of view to just a health point of view. And I think a lot of people who messaged me and wanted to have a podcast like this, which is like, I can't get away from just like feeling like shit or saying things inside my head that make me feel terrible. If I don't do the hard workout, if I don't run five miles, if I don't eat super clean, quote unquote, all week long. And so I don't know, what are your thoughts on that about maybe trying to teach clients how like a win, a small win is better than not playing the game at all? Yeah. I think that the thing here is you have to understand it's, it, you're choosing to think a certain way mm. and, and for whatever it's worth when I was out there and rollerblading and I was having a blast in my head, there were still thoughts being like, man, I really should have just fucking done some rows and presses. <laughs> and like, and like in my head, I was like, I should have yeah. done this and this and this. But when I tell people you're choosing to think a certain way, I'm not saying those thoughts are bad. Mm. What I'm saying is recognize the thoughts you're having, accept them and then think about like, 
realistically, what would you, what do you think is a better thing to think about? Yeah. So like another way to phrase it is what would you tell a friend mm. who told you they were saying the same thing? If your best friend was telling you like, Hey, you know, I, I felt like I should have done a workout, but I didn't want to. So I just went on a, on a walk. I got a, a few thousand steps in, wasn't intense. I feel like a fat shit. I feel like a slob. Like, I feel like I really should have worked out. Yep. Like you wouldn't tell your friend like, yeah, you really are a piece of shit. Like you should, <laughs> you'd be like, listen, you got it in. Like yeah. life is long. Like if you're lucky, you know, like you, you got out, you did something like at least you were for, whereas if it's yourself, you're like, I'm such an asshole. I'm the worst. I'm a fat shit. It's like, recognize how you're talking to yourself, recognize the thoughts you're having and then be like, okay, what's like the, the better train of thought here mm. and, and move on. And it, again, it's not to say those thoughts will, will be eliminated. It's not to say they won't ever come up, but it is to say that you have to be objectively aware of them mm. and sort of look at yourself from an outsider's perspective and say, why am, why am I talking to myself like this? Yeah. Like I'm out, I'm moving. I'm not a pro athlete. Yeah. Like even then, if you are a pro athlete, like they have bad days as well. Mm. Like, the, you know, it's funny. Like one of the cool things that I, that I got from working with professional athletes is, you know, sometimes they don't want to work out mm-hmm. and like sometimes they have really bad workouts. And, uh, I think people, it's a natural human trait to be very hard on yourself. Yeah. And I would, I would say that probably everybody listening would say something to the effect of they're their own harshest critic. Mm-hmm. And it's like, just have to be aware of it and, and realize like you're probably going to treat your worst enemy better than you treat yourself. Yeah. So like start treating yourself a little bit better. Yeah, I agree, man. And I think something else that I think triggers that in a lot of people and that I've dealt with particularly, and I came from an aesthetic sport. I did a lot, I did gymnastics my whole life. I coached gymnastics. That's like my bread and butter is, um, like the comparison, uh, aspect of that comes up. And I think that's another thing that social media internet's a blessing and a curse, but we didn't used to see everybody's six packs on, you know, Instagram through a filtered highlighted reel. And we also didn't used to see everyone's PRs all the time. We just lived in our own bubble and like every <laughs> once in a while, you know? And so now I think a lot about that. I mean, I coach a lot of like, um, young teenage gymnasts and their parents talk to me a lot about this, but also just as everyday humans that we, we have at our, our fitness facility, you know, they, their, their stuff's not good enough because this kid over here is deadlifting 500 pounds or this girl <laughs> over here is running. So I feel like, I don't know, do you have clients who are constantly struggling with that as well, especially as we live in kind of more of a bubble world right now on social media? Yeah, man, you know, everybody's struggling with this. Everyone from your, the consumers of content and the creators of content, mm. right? Like everyone's struggling with this. And it's actually, it's very interesting for me because I can see both sides. Mm. Um, from the creator's content perspective, man, I've seen a rise in disordered eating habits. I've seen a rise. This is actually, I, I've only spoken about this one other person, uh, Dr. Aaron Horshig from Squat University. Yeah, my buddy. A rise in injuries from training oh, because yeah. people feel like they need to be showing their PRs every time they post. So they're constantly lifting heavy. It's like the creators are constantly restricting themselves in nutrition. They're constantly feeling like they need to look a certain way. They're constantly feeling like they need to, uh, uh, lift a certain amount or do something incredible in order to get more likes and more follows. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it feeds this loop of the consumers then feeling bad about themselves because they can't do any of that stuff (laughs) near that level. And so every, all that we're seeing is a loop of people hating themselves more and more and more and giving and, and feeding into this loop so that they continue to hate themselves more and more and more. It's a really like negative, negative uh, cycle that we've fallen into. And I don't have, I I don't like the idea of saying, well, just get off social media. I think it's a really stupid idea. I I think it's, it's, it's not the right way. Anytime you have a fear or you have an anxiety or you have a problem, the right answer is not to ignore it. Yeah. The right answer is to, to dig deeper and understand why is it bothering you and how can we address it? Mm. And I think the, the best way is do what we're doing right now and make people aware of what's actually going on. Yep. Make people aware that like one thing that I've noticed from social media is people will message me and they'll, I've never spoken to them in my life. I've never said a word to them. I've never interacted with them. And, and they'll just message me be like, what should my calories be? And that's all the, that's like how they start. And I'm like, Hey, my name's Jordan. Nice to meet you. And they'll be like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't even like think that you're a human. Right. It's like, I think when we're looking at a screen in our hand, looking at someone else that maybe we've never interacted with before, maybe they're, they have a crazy physique or super strong. Mm. Like 
We don't even think of them as a real human. Like we know logically they're a human, but we don't think about them that way. We don't think about like, what's it like for them to post this? How many times did it take for them to film this? How many shots did it take to get that one angle with yep. that lighting? How much time yep. did they spend filtering this? Like we don't think about that because you don't know it. Yep. So I think the more that we can have these discussions and make people aware of, of both sides of the equation, the better, better people will be able to deal with it. Mm, yeah, that's super well said. And it's funny because the same thing happens on my side. Like, hey, my back hurts. What do you think I can do to fix that and it's like uh <laughs> give me a little give me a little time man <laughs> <laughs> could, could you imagine just like someone walking up to you in person like no introduction like even at the gym yeah. like even like in the, your the place where you work they would mm. at least be like hey how's it going yeah da, 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 da. but like online where there's this huge barrier it's uh, people are desensitized and they mm. don't realize they're talking to a real human being. Yeah. And what's weird about social media too is, is this is the other point I was going to make is like when you, you mentioned like the creators have more anxiety around looking a certain way or performing a certain way. It's like, clearly that's not a great way to live. And the person on the consumer side of that is miserable. So like what the fuck man, like both people are equally worse off because of this, we're approaching it. And I always think a lot about like what like uh, screens seem to remove the need to be vulnerable and be honest with someone and have empathy. It seems like that just removes the need to do that, which is why like a lot of people just are not afraid to rock it off in a comment section about how terrible you are. But it's like, hey, do you want to come to my house and mention that to my face? I'm like, oh God, I'm, not, I'm never going to do that again. You know? So it's weird. It's this weird dynamic where nobody wins except like maybe the platform and then like the people in between get crushed. And, I, and it's just a bizarre phenomenon. Well, you just hit on the point, the platform wins. Yeah. The platform wins and the platform wins because more people spend more time on it. They get more emotional on it. And that means that advertisers are going to do better yeah. because more people are seeing advertisements and buying from them, which means the platform is going to love it because they're making more money from the advertisers. And, and that's what really people don't understand about social media is that people think of Facebook, Instagram, whatever, as these, these social media platforms. That's what they started as but they're mm. not social media platforms. They're advertising platforms. Yeah. That's what they're there for. They're there to make ungodly amounts of money from companies who are spending ungodly amounts of money to get their product in front of your face. Mm. And it just so happens that the best way to keep you on that platform is through what looks like a social media, which is like interacting with other people, sharing content, blah, 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 yeah. blah. But it's an advertising platform is what it is. Yeah. And it's actually really interesting because you just perfectly segued to the next point I was going to make is I feel like a lot, I've talked about this with one person as well on the podcast, but not exclusively is I feel like we're, we're morphing into vice based capitalism. Like I really face, I feel like parts of the fitness industry and the marketing industry, the medical injury marketing, the pain is like either less than marketing. Like you're not lean enough. You're not fit enough. You're not strong enough. Your hair is not good enough. You're not nice enough, whatever it is. They sell you shit you need to feel better about not being good enough. And then on the other side is like a lot of these companies are really invested in don't deal with the problem. Watch this show, watch this screen, stare at this longer and ignore your problems. And I feel like as a human, I just really have an icky feeling about that. When I look at a lot of the way some of these fitness trad, uh, fitness trends and marketing trends, especially nutrition is going right. Like you're not oh, good. Yeah. enough, And it's like, Oh, it's so gross, man. They're, they're appealing to, uh, to people's, like you said, vices, they're appealing to their vices, not to their needs. Yeah. Right. Like they're appealing to like, what's your, your deepest emotional, uh, they call it a pain point in marketing. Yep. Like what's your yep. major pain point? What, like, what is going to be the thing that really sets you off? How can I feed into that and then get you to pay me something so that I can further feed into this vice as opposed to actually helping you? Mm. Yeah. And like insecurities, right? They, they're willing to open Pandora's box of insecurity and pull out whatever that deepest one is for you. Dude, it, it's anyone who, who, under, who has been involved in marketing will know this, mm. but, um, like, in the, the process of building my business of like I've studied marketing yeah. and it's one of the things that you know, I I'm a coach first and foremost, like I'm a coach, mm -hmm. but as you grow your business, you have to learn marketing. You get, like, if you want to actually like do better, make more sales, blah, 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 and essentially help more people. One of the things that I hated about learning marketing from just straight up marketers was mm -hmm. they would use terms like a pain point. Yeah. They would literally say, you want to find your, your customer's pain point. I'd be like, I don't like that at all. Like I don't <laughs> yeah. want to find their pain, they, whatever they're insecure about. That's what you want to target. I'm like, that sounds terrible. Like yeah. why would I ever like want to find what they're insecure about and hit that home just so that they will check out and like hit add to cart and pay me. Like that's a terrible way to do it. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I see, uh, we see on social media, it's very interesting. We, we're talking about a lot of negatives, but there's actually a tremendous amount of positives. I'd say it's net more positive. Agree. But for example, when we see, if you go to off the top of my head, 
I, we see the Kardashians, for example, and the Kardashians, they, they might promote a, a skinny tee or a boom bot or whatever it is. And you go to the comment section of the post in which they're promoting one of these ridiculous products that like are promote like, are telling you that you're going to lose a ton of weight. You see the comments and you've got people being like, stop selling this nonsense. This is ridiculous. Like stop selling out. Like we know this doesn't work. And five, 10 years ago, that wouldn't have happened like mm. at all. Like people weren't being exposed like that before. And the marketing before was infomercials and, and commercials and radio slots and billboards where you could say these ridiculous yeah. things and everyone would believe it. Yeah. You can even like hear how like the voices in, in infomercials and commercials were different, like in less than 90 days. <laughs> yeah. It's like, could you imagine if I went on my Instagram? I was like, in less than 90 <laughs> days. You're, I was like, no, it's like now because smaller personal brands have really give, been given the opportunity to to show who they are and the truth. Now more and more people are really understanding it and not falling victim to mm. a lot what a lot of the big companies are doing. Yep. It's still very prevalent and and new vices and new issues have arisen as a result of that. But uh, I would I would say that there's still a tr- a net positive in terms of what social media has done. Yeah, no, I would agree completely. And I mean, it's this, it's this concept of, I think I don't remember where I read this from, but like conscious capitalism, right? Like if you're, this is kind of my, like, I guess, plea to everybody listening to this that's working in fitness, health, nutrition, whatever else it is. It's like, you have a responsibility to help the everyday customer who needs you just give more and be valuable in the same way that like you just talked about the example of you know going to someone and getting kind of like thrown jargon at you if i go to get my car fixed i'm like my oil's something and doesn't work he's like oh well the reverse carbonator is going to get pressure into the valve and you need these it's like dude i don't know what you're talking about just like i don't want to blow up in my car please like we have a responsibility in the fitness industry in the health industry to filter like the alan aragons of the world and the crazy eric cressies and put them in a package that people can have a better life. And I feel like that's something I am seeing change. And, and we have a mutual connection through Gary is like, he's someone who's saying that, like, you can give more, you can be valuable, you can just not be a dick. And you can actually help people in the long run. And I feel like that's what I hope comes out of a lot more of these conversations is like, give, 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 and don't be a jerk. And eventually the money will work itself out. A hundred percent. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and on that point too, I was going to circle back to this nutrition point is with the concept of consistency and motivation and stuff. And and on the nutrition front is I feel as though personally that a lot of people are also still trying their best to like this one thing is going to make me blank, whatever, prettier, skinnier, faster. I don't even know what it is. Um, but in my mind, nutrition is the most complex thing we've ever talked about, right? In like all of healthcare. And I always make a joke that like my buddy's a PA and he like went to the best surgeon in Boston to do his residency. And he was like the head neurologist and the head cardiologist were like, I don't know what's wrong with this person. Like we, we're still figuring it out. And I think nutrition's the same way. Like even the smartest people of the world, like I, I, we're still getting there. So how in the world do we expect people to understand it at a, at a tiny level? Um, and I'm wondering the, the long story here is if there were a few things that if you were going back and you were advising people on like here just stick to like these couple things in basic nutrition and we'll get here first and then we'll move to the advanced stuff down the road like what are those few things that the average day listener is like all right i'm going to focus on blank 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 just to start and then we'll get somewhere yeah so i'm going to lay out a couple of things that i would recommend starting with the the highest barrier of entry like the most Mm -hmm. difficult to do but i think the most important Mm -hmm. um I know from doing this for years and years and years, a lot of people listening won't do what I'm about to say. But if you do this for 30 days, the rest of your life will be easier. Uh, And the first day will be the hardest. The second day will be a little bit easier. Third day is a little bit easier. And by the time you get to day 30, it'll be like almost second nature. Mm. But I think everybody should count their calories for 30 days. And I don't mean like check the calories like on the backside of the thing and then just think you're going to remember it because you're not. Yeah. Like you won't, I mean, if there's no, if there's no, uh, nutrition label, then you Google it, you go into my fitness pal, you go into Mike's macros, you get one of these apps fit day. There's a billion of them yeah. and you, you track your calories for literally everything you put in your mouth for 30 days. I don't care if it's water, obviously there's zero calories in water, but you track that you put it down on your food log for that day. If you had eight ounces of water, 
put it and say zero calories, whatever, mm. but you count your calories, track everything that goes in your mouth for 30 days. If you have like a, I don't know, if you have a cheeseburger, well, how do you track a cheeseburger? Well, you go to Google and you type in like how many calories in a cheeseburger and there's going to come up all these like different uh, possibilities, like how many ounces of beef, like, I don't know, about five ounces of beef, whatever it is, mm. one slice of American cheese. And you're going to add up all the calories and it's going to take a lot of time in the first few days because you've never done it before and yep. you don't have that skill yet. Anytime you're learning a new skill, it's going to take more time in the beginning. Yep. The better you get at it, the better, the easier it's going to be. If you, if you count your calories for 30 days, you will, for the rest of your life, have a better understanding of nutrition, yeah. portion control. It's just, it's a, a relatively big barrier of entry, but once you do it, you, I'm not going to say you're never going to struggle with your weight, but I am going to say you will never not understand why you might be struggling <laughs> with your weight. Like you'll yeah. know because like, Oh, all right. Well, I didn't realize that I was eating this many calories because I just had no idea. Yep. Uh, so that'd be number one. If you don't want to count calories, I have uh, another method. I have two other methods that you can use. One of them being my three plates, two, two snacks method. Super simple. Um, the f this has worked very well for a lot, a lot of my clients. Literally, I just had a guy on my podcast recently who was my first ever client oh, nice. six, year, six years ago that I used this with. Uh, he lost 90 pounds and he's maintained it. Wow. Um, it's just every day you're going to have three meals and two snacks. Each meal fits on one plate. Each snack fits in the palm of your hand. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you'll have protein on every plate, right? Ideally, you'll have a, a fruit or a vegetable. And people are like, well, what if I don't like vegetables for breakfast? Then don't fucking have vegetables for <laughs> breakfast. But three plates, two snacks. Yep. Three meals, every meal fits on one plate, every snack fits in the palm of your hand. Ideally for your snack, I'd like it to be a protein or a fruit. But you know, right in the drawer next to me, I've got peanut M&Ms. Sometimes I'll make my snack a fistful of peanut M&Ms and that'll be it. Mm. And then what do I do the next snack? I get back on track. It's yep. not a big deal. Yep. It's, it's not about what you do in one day or one meal. It's what you do over the long term that makes the most difference. Yep. So three plates, two snacks is another one. And then I have another one. There's always coming up with new strategies to like help different people. This is the easiest one. This is, uh, the one, two, three method. Mm. And basically the one, two, three method is this isn't all you can eat in a day, but all I'm asking you to do is to please include these three things in your day. Number one, have a salad every day. Just like make sure you include a salad in your day. I don't care what time of day you eat it. I don't care what salad dressing you use. Just have a big bowl with some vegetables in it. If you want to put salad dressing on top, amazing. You want to put tuna, chicken, beef, I don't care, but a fucking salad. Mm. This is, and it's crazy to me how many questions I get about salads. It's like, well, what type of salad? Can I have croutons on my salad? I was like, <laughs> just fucking a salad. A salad, I don't care. Just a big bowl with vegetables. Yeah. Don't, don't like take a big bowl and then put a, uh, a, a croissant in there mm. and say like, all right, this is my salad. No, it's not, that's not a fucking salad. Just a salad of veggies, right? Yep. Um, one salad a day, two pieces of fruit. I don't care if it's banana. I don't care if it's mango. I don't care if it's an apple. I don't two pieces of fruit and three bottles of water. I don't care how many ounces they are. I don't care how big they are. I just one salad, two pieces of fruit and three bottles of water every day. Yep. And if you do that, you're going to be in a really good spot. Yeah. Like, Obviously, if you're going out and you're having like tons of pizza and pies and cakes and donuts on top of that, you're probably not going to be doing the right thing. But if you're if you're sticking to the one, two, three method at the very, very least, odds are you're not going to be wanting to do all of that. You're, mm. you're going to be full. You're going to be satiated. You're not going to be like feeling like, OK, I need to binge on any of this stuff. So yep. those are the three methods that I have, starting with the most difficult, going all the way down to the least difficult to include if you want to improve your nutrition. Yeah, it's great. And it's funny because like the, the same exact conversation happens with recovery on the other side with medical strength and conditioning is I get a bajillion emails about like, should I buy a gun? Should I buy a floaty <laughs> pant? Should I like, you know, do this crazy ass like diet to get there? And it's like, dude, sleep drink a lot of water, don't be a jackass with your training and have good periodization. And like maybe once in a while, think about the stress outside your life and that will help. And like, it's, it's mind blowing to me how much money people spend on like, like, don't get me wrong. Like we use those tools. They have a value. They have a place. I don't want to like get uh, the, the crazy emails the other way. But like, if you're not knocking out sleep, good nutrition, feel yourself for performance, water and stress management, like what kind of conversation are we having here? And like Dr. Sands, head OTC recovery expert is the same way. He's like, it's all useless really if you're not doing those four. So people like get that so wrong sometimes. Uh, same thing, same exact thing with supplements, right? Yeah. Usually when people start trying to lose weight, they're like, what supplements should I get? I'm like, yo, wrong question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like wrong place to begin. So, and it's funny because 
the thing about supplements is it's in the name, like it's supplemental mm. to, it's literally in the name. This is, that's not the first thing you do. Strength train three times a week, at least make sure you're getting about seven to 10,000 steps a day. Make sure you're getting at least eight hours of sleep mm-hmm. and uh, track your calories. Like if you're not doing that on a, if you haven't done that at least for 30 days, all of it, there's, and you're buying supplements, your shit is broken. Mm. Like, there's no reason for you to be buying supplements if you can't do all of that for 30 days consistently. Mm-hmm. Yep. I couldn't agree more. It's funny because the the supplement conversation, the recovery conversation, and just like the training in general conversation goes from like the everyday person trying to lose 10 pounds and like literally the most elite athlete. I've had the same conversation with both of those people. And it's crazy because everyone just, again, back to the mentality of go, go, go more white knuckle it coaches. And everybody think like, if I just bury myself in training and work harder, it's like, adaptation doesn't happen with just training load. It happens with the optimal dose of training and the optimal dose of recovery in the same way that like all this marries together. So it's like, no one's uh, not involved in this conversation. We're all humans. It's the same biology. A hundred percent. It's exactly right. And also, I don't know why I just thought of this. Uh, is I had a Karen moment when you like started talking that voice. Do you enjoy playing Karen or Jerry Bag of Donuts more in your YouTube videos? I had to ask that question. So, so it's Kenzie. Kenzie, Kenzie is, the, is the wig. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I, li- I like playing them both equally. I think I used to, I used to like Kenzie more, um, <laughs> but I think I've found more depth within Johnny Bag of Donuts recently. <laughs> it resonates it, deep. It's been fun. Like, <laughs> it, it sounds weird because I'm by no means an actor, yeah. but like I've found myself doing things with Johnny that I didn't. It wasn't in the scope of his character before, so it's yeah, been fun. That's hilarious. Um, anyways, that was random, but yeah. So I'm conscious of your time, and I want to let you go early. I know you got other busy stuff to do. I don't want you to feel stressed running from thing to thing. So we have a recurring segment that we started in quarantine of, of 20 rapid fire questions, and nice. so I, this is a curveball. This is completely jokes aside. These are not serious, but uh, I'd love to wreck you through those and see if you have uh, your quick fire answers. So they're this or that's or like would you rather's. Okay, just so you know, I suck with rapid fire Doesn't stuff. Matter. Sometimes it's like I'm just bad with it, but let's see. All right, so the goal is two minutes, but no pressure. You know okay. I mean? All right, music, music or podcasts? Music. Road trips or plane rides? Plane rides. Would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? One horse-sized duck. <laughs> <laughs> Your best piece of advice for young fitness professionals? Get really, 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 really good at coaching. Mm. Coaching real people, not textbooks. Yeah. Um, would you rather eat butter raw or eat eggs raw? Eggs raw. I was going, I was trying to bring up a trauma memory of like your butter <laughs> episode. <laughs> uh, who was your biggest childhood celebrity crush? Jennifer Aniston. Still a smoke show. Let's just be real. <laughs> yeah. um, would you rather be a giant hamster or a tiny rhino? Giant hamster. Yeah. One th- imagine the hamster ball you'd get with being a giant <laughs> hamster. Uh, <laughs> one thing you're terrified of. Um, what am I terrified of? I'm terrified of, uh, this is going to sound weird. I'm terrified of getting stabbed. Like that scares the shit out of I'm, me. <laughs> I'm, ter- I'm terrified of being buried alive without a coffin. So not in a coffin, like just straight dirt. Yeah. I that saw- sounds, that sounds worse. That sounds definitely worse. I saw a CSI <laughs> episode when I was a little kid and that happened and I was like, never, never again. <laughs> um, uh, I lost track. Card games or board games? Board games. Sushi or pizza? Sushi. Ooh, I knew that was quick. I knew that was coming. Would you rather live the rest of your life with horse legs or a mermaid tail? I can't say a straight face. Horse legs. <laughs> something, <laughs> <laughs> something on your bucket list. Uh, go to Thailand. Mm. Ice coffee or hot coffee or neither? Ice coffee. Yep. This is a great one. Would you rather always have to talk like Yoda or always have to breathe like Darth Vader? Always talk like Yoda. <laughs> you would sound awesome, right? Uh, <laughs> one one person you look up to. Um, Eric Cressy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, your dream place to live in the world? Israel. Yep. The best thing you've bought under $20? Uh, the under $20 one. Um. This is credit, Probably, credit to Tim. This is Tim Ferriss's question, so I can't claim it. This is a really tough one. The best thing I bought for under $20. Um, <laughs> I don't know. One of the things that cleans the screen on my phone. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say the widget thing that cleans your, your uh, screen for your MacBook, but whatever. Uh, favorite childhood TV show? Hey, Arnold. Oh, yeah. I was hoping it was in the Nickelodeon region. Mine was guts. Uh, would you rather only drink from a baby bottle for the rest of your life or wear a pajama onesie everywhere for the rest of your life? 
drink from the baby bottle. Nice. <laughs> and th- that's tough, man. Imagine being at dinner and drinking wine from a baby bottle. Um, can, can you imagine like being really, really thirsty <laughs> and like, <laughs> like after a hard workout, it's, like, it's just not coming out fast enough. <laughs> that would suck. Um, all right. And then lastly, one message you wish the whole world could see. One message? Yeah, like a billboard. If everybody had to see one billboard, what would be on it? Don't take life too seriously. Mm, well said. Like, relax a little bit. Yeah. You ever watch, <laughs> you ever watch uh, Hot Ones, the, the wing show where they're yes, like, yeah. Yes. So that's, this is my mini version of Hot Ones is like try to get them down and then like ask a deep philosophical question. It's getting there. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Man. And dude, your, your voice is like the perfect voice for podcast. Bro, radio. it's this I'm microphone. It's this microphone, your, dude. I swear to God. No. There's no way you can't, you, the microphone doesn't make your voice like that. Yeah. Like I've got a microphone too and your voice sounds way better. <laughs> Maybe I should switch to like midnight, like jazz radio, like next then 24 PR. You have to, man. Like, <laughs> ser- and you, <laughs> as, you're, you literally have the best voice as or, you were talking earlier. I was like, I'm so jealous. Or I could go sleaze bag and I can make those advertisements for like, like lose your fat in 90 days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's get you out of here, man. I know you got a busy day. So thank you for doing this and uh, give you some plugs. Where can everyone find you and, and get all your deets? Because I think th- people want to know more. Yeah. Uh, my own podcast, The Jordan Syatt Mini Podcast, YouTube. Or, like If you Google my name, Jordan Syatt, you're going to find everything. You got it. All right, man. Thank you so much for your time. I super appreciate it. Thank you, bro. Have a wonderful night.